Morning, Church. So the reading today is Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still bringing out the murderer's threat against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoner to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, So, so, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? So asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The man traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eye, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there were a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house in Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hand on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the way, uh, on the road, as you were coming here, has sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. G'day again. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks very much for reading for us there. Well, g'day, everybody. It's awesome to be here this morning. As I said before, we're away for a couple of weeks, and it's great to be back. You know, every time we're away, we just... We, we come back to church and we, we miss you all. We, it's, we miss friends and we miss family. We miss being together as God's people. So it really is just refreshing food for the soul to be here this morning. Caleb and I went to an event last night run by Open Doors. They're a ministry that we support and they're all about serving the persecuted church. And the focus was on Iran last night and they had someone from the Iranian church uh, share their testimony, the story about what it's like to be a Christian there. And my goodness... These Christians are doing it tough over there, but they are faith-filled. And he shared particularly that um, they really can't meet together at all publicly as Christians, and they get quite lonely as Christians, and they, they meet, there's a few of them only that can risk a meeting together once a month for two hours, and they just count down the minutes until they can meet together, and they cherish every single minute of it. And he said when they, when they gather together, they put the projector on the wall for the songs and they sing, but they can't sing loud because of the neighbours. And so they just, I don't even know what it's like, but they whisper, they whisper worship. And as, as I was uh, here experiencing, hearing your voices, I was so encouraged, so encouraged to hear everyone lifting up their voices to the one true God that we worship together. And my heart went out to these Christians in, in places where they can't do that. Well, they can't meet. And man, are we blessed to be able to meet like this? We are, aren't we? It's a blessing and a joy. So I just wanted to, to encourage you with that, that it's good to be here, to be hungry for what God wants to teach us from his word, and, and to be encouraged by the people sitting on your right and your left. They are your brothers and sisters in the faith. And we are here to encourage each other, to persevere, to keep going. That's why we're here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, well, a couple of weeks ago, the service, the final Sunday I had before we took a couple of weeks off was just such a special Sunday, wasn't it? it was Baptism Sunday. Hey, every Sunday special, right? 
Yeah, especially when I'm speaking. No, every Sunday is special. And uh, that was just a particularly beautiful time, wasn't it? Seeing some of our brothers and sisters being baptised and having other people stand up here and share their story. Brothers and sisters, church family members sharing about their stories. I don't know about you, I love hearing people's stories. I'm a sucker for biopics, for, for biographies, for autobiographies. I just love it. I love hearing people's stories. And I don't think there's, there's much else more encouraging for the Christian than hearing how God has been at work in someone's life. Don't you reckon? It just, it builds our faith, doesn't it? How God has been at work in someone's life. Hearing how through different relationships, different circumstances, and let's face it, sometimes really difficult times, God shows up. Time and time again we hear it. He shows up and so often we hear when people share their story that, that God prods them. You know, God prods us into considering him. He, he challenges our thinking maybe on an issue or, or he, he sometimes he just even irritates us with his incredible love and mercy, doesn't he? That we might come to know him. Hearing these stories, these testimonies, it really builds our faith. It reminds us that God's at work. Because let's be honest, sometimes we get discouraged, don't we? We need to be continually reminded that God is always at work. He is at work in his people. He's at work in the world. Well, in our passage for today, this is going to be our focus, God being at work through his transforming grace. That's going to be our focus for today, the transforming power of God's grace, transformation. We're back in our series called Acts. You can see behind us, we've named it, I Will Build My Church. That's quoting Jesus, talking about how he is going to build his church. In this series, we're looking at the fifth book of the New Testament called Acts, and it really is the history of the church, volume one. It's an incredibly encouraging book. And today we're looking at the change that takes place when Jesus is involved. We're exploring maybe the most famous conversion in all of church history. And as we're going to do that, we're going to be asking the question, what are the key ingredients for people coming to faith? What are they? Now, your story, of how, if you're a Christian person, of how you became a Christian, I'm going to get the guess, probably a little bit different to the one we're looking at in the Bible today, but no matter what, no matter your story, it will share a couple of things with the story we read today. At least two things, I think. What are they? Well, we're going to look at them. So, before we go any further, probably a question to answer is, who is this character that we're looking at today? His name is Saul. Thomas read for us so well. Great to have you reading for us, brother. A couple of weeks ago, baptized in the name of Jesus, up here reading the Bible. Amen. <laughs> so good. He's going to be preaching next week. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. No, seriously, can you preach next week? That'd be great. Okay. Okay, so who is this Saul character we're looking at in, in Acts chapter 9? This is the Apostle Paul be before he became the Apostle Paul. Before he wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. Before that, he was a guy called Saul, and he was a really different man. In Acts, we learn just a little bit about him in chapters 7 and 8, and what we see so far ain't pretty. What we learn about him ain't pretty. In chapter 7 and 8, you might remember, Luke, the author of Acts, tells us Saul was there, present at the murder of the disciple Stephen. Now, Stephen was a follower of Jesus, and he just boldly shared about his faith. He proclaimed the truth about who Jesus is and what he did, and this really angered the religious authorities. So much so, they set up a mock trial, like a sham trial, and had him executed. Stephen became the first Christian martyr in church history. And we're told Saul was there, giving approval to everything that went on. He was glad to see this wonderful man of God killed. Full on, hey? Chapter 8, verse 3 tells us, well, sorry, before that, so Stephen's killed, a great persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. Saul's behind a lot of it. Acts chapter th uh, 8, verse 3, sorry, tells us that Saul began to destroy the church. It's going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. 
This is the person we are looking at today. Now, because of this persecution, Christians leave, right? They flee the city, and some go to a city called Damascus, and Paul's not content to leave them there. He wants to hunt them down. So he goes to the religious leaders, the authorities, and gets their official blessing, that if he finds any in Damascus, he, he gets official letters so that when he finds them, he can arrest them, drag them back to Jerusalem, and throw them in prison. Saul is an ambitious young Pharisee, just you know, a religious person, part of the religious establishment, super smart, very zealous for God, a rising star in that religious establishment, and he hated these Christians. He's zealous, angry, smart, organized, a lethal combination. Right, this man's on a mission, and he believes he's on a mission from God. So, there's Saul on his way to Damascus from Jerusalem about a week's journey back then. And something happens. <laughs> Boy, does something happen. Something happens that changes the course of his life, that changes the course of, of church history. Saul meets Jesus. Saul encounters the risen Jesus. So there's Saul proudly leading an entourage, carrying official letters in his pocket. There he is, seemingly executing a, a righteous mission. And Saul is blown off his horse by the enormously powerful light of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing story. He's blown off his horse by light. He encounters the holiness of Jesus in the middle of the day. Jesus' bright light is brighter than the midday sun. Paul knocked off his horse. And then Jesus speaks. Can you imagine? Jesus speaks, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Don't you think the phrasing of that uh, is quite interesting? Don't you think? Saul, why do you persecute me? You know, Saul, I mean... He's imprisoning who? Jesus' followers, right? I mean, not Jesus himself. Yet Jesus identifies himself so much with his followers, so much with his church, that when Saul is persecuting his followers, Jesus says, you're persecuting me. A bit of a side note, but for me, this is just a great reminder that Jesus Christ is with us. Amen? He is with us. Right? He's not far. He's near. He's not a distant God, unconcerned with his people and their problems. He is intimately involved with us, right? And he has promised that he will never leave us. I will be with you always. Never forsake us. Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul replies, fair question, who are you? And he adds, who, Lord, who are you, Lord? Now, the Lord could just mean like a sir, like master, or maybe Paul's, uh, sorry, Saul is already figured out who he's encountered. Who are you, Lord? Jesus replies, who am I? I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. He then gives Saul an instruction, go into the city, there you'll receive further instructions. And the other men Saul are traveling with, they don't seem to experience it the same way he does, right? They... They hear some sounds and, you know, they see probably Saul knocked off his horse. But then they can see the effect this whole experience has had on Saul. Because Saul gets up and what's happened? We're told that he can't see. He's been blinded, blinded by the light. That's where that song gets it from, I guess. Blinded by the light. Now these men have got to take Saul by the hand and help him into the city. Now, what an amazing experience. I mean, look, what a humbling experience. Don't you reckon? We're going to come back to that. What a humbling experience for Saul. Now, let's just pause here in the story so far. There is so much that we could talk about in this passage. I'm only going to touch on a couple of things. But let's pause here and reflect on the encounter Saul has had. Now, let's think about this. Let me ask you this. Who would you say are the passive and active characters in the story? Pretty obvious, isn't it? It's pretty clear. Who are the passive, who are the active characters in the story? Let's think about it for a second. Let's think about Saul. 
he was hardly seeking God, was he? Right? Hardly a seeker. You know, he hadn't started attending an Alpha course, you know. He hadn't started coming to church, and he was just sitting up the back checking things out. Hadn't just attended a newish night. Wasn't reading the case for Christ, you know. He wasn't weighing up the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. No, no, no. He was clearly anti. I think we can all agree on that. Clearly anti-Jesus, hunting down his followers. He wasn't warm to the things of God. We can also see it, right, by the way the story unfolds. There's Saul traveling on the road. Jesus reveals himself in a powerful way, knocked off his horse by the holy light of God. And then Saul, later has his name changed to Paul. He actually talks a bit about this episode. Check it out. In 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's have a look here. See if my little thing's working. We got some... Oh, cool. It's not up there, but... Yeah, that's it. Okay. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Paul speaking years later about this, right? I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Right, Paul here, he's keen to point out the obvious, he was against Christ. But Jesus' grace, faith, and love were poured out on him so abundantly. Right, I love that image, like, like in front of a river in flood. Now, that I imagine would be a very scary thing. Lots of floods happening around our country at the moment. But imagine being in front of a river of grace, a river of love, a river of mercy, being baptized with that. It's a beautiful image, being overcome in a positive way by his grace and love. Beautiful picture. So to me, it's really clear, right? Stating the obvious, Saul is not the key player in his conversion, right? It's Jesus and his transforming grace, no doubt about it. But I think we should note something here about the grace of Christ, right? His grace is not sudden or compulsive. Let's explore that for a minute. It's not sudden or compulsive. It's not sudden, right? This episode, it's not out of the blue, right? God had been working on Saul behind the scenes before this moment. When Saul, Paul, is describing these events to others in, later in Acts, in Acts chapter 26, he adds a detail to the story that's not here. Right? Same thing kind of happens. Saul's knocked off his horse. Jesus says the same words, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? But he adds something else, and it's this. Jesus says something else in this moment. He says to Saul, why do you kick against the goads? What does that mean? Why do you kick against the goads? I remember reading this for the first time a while ago, and I had to look that one up. What does that mean? Well, it was an ancient kind of well-known proverb, right? To kick against, don't kick against the goads. What's a goad? A goad is a sharp stick used to break in wild animals. Okay, that's a goad. And even now we have the phrase, right? To goad someone is to irritate them. Don't kick against the goads. So what does this mean? It means that Jesus had been prodding Saul before this moment, as he does. He had been prodding him irritating him, working on him before this Damascus Road experience, working on his conscience, right? highlighting doubts, asking him questions. Now, we don't exactly know how this happened, but it did. Right? Jesus, he, he's been described as the great hound of heaven, the pursuer. Jesus, the great hound of heaven, had been pursuing this man before his Damascus Road experience, and Saul had been kicking against him. Leave me alone. Get out of my mind. You know, I wonder if you can relate to that. I sure can. I sure can. You know, I know this powerfully in my own life. Before, before I became a Christian, you know, I, I was aware of Jesus. I knew who he was, and I knew him to be a kind and gracious God. But I also didn't really want to know him. You know, I didn't really want to know him. He would often reveal himself to me in truth, particularly when I was doing dumb things, 
when I was choosing foolish things, I, I would, he would be revealing him, Dave, is this a good idea? <laughs> Leave me alone. I'd say that all the time. Leave me alone. I, I want to live my life my way. But praise God, he did not leave me alone. I thank God that he did not because he has relentlessly pursued me with his love and grace. And maybe you can relate to that too. So Saul's conversion wasn't sudden. God had been working on him. God's grace can be quite gradual. I've heard that today it takes at least often two years for someone to come to faith. That's a lot of prodding. God's grace can be gradual. And it also, it's not compulsive. Let's explore that. His grace is not compulsive as in against Saul's will. Now, yes, Jesus appeared in a flash of light, right? Knocked him off his horse. And, okay, that's pretty proactive, okay, on the case of Jesus. I think we can agree on that. But Jesus didn't crush him, right? He he didn't completely overwhelm him. He didn't crush Saul. And notice this, if this is so Jesus, what does he do? What's the first thing he does after knocking him off his horse with by his presence? He asks him a question. Isn't that so Jesus? Invitational. Saul, what are you doing? Saul, why why are you persecuting me? What are you doing? First thing he does is he asks him a question. Doesn't give him a command. He doesn't say, bow down before me, which he could, right? He has every right to say that. I mean, Jesus got all authority and power in the world, infinite, without limit, without comparison. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But how does our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, act in this instance? He asks a question. Kindness. Even respect. So what are you doing? What's driving you to do this? There's no question the cause of Saul's conversion, transforming power of, of God's grace, absolutely. But the sovereign grace of God is gradual and gentle. The grace of God is gentle. See, he revealed himself to Saul, not to overcome him, but in such a way as to enable him to make a free response. I read this quote this week, and it really stuck with me by the great John Stott. Read this with me. Divine grace, God's grace, Christ's grace, does not trample on human personality. Rather, the reverse, for it enables human beings to be truly human. It is sin which imprisons. It is grace which liberates The grace of God so frees us from the bondage of our pride, prejudice, and self-centeredness as to enable us to repent and believe. Man, isn't that profound? Don't you think this is just, I, I don't know what you think, but this is pretty much the opposite of how our culture would view Jesus in the church, don't you reckon? I mean, to submit to God surely would mean oppression, wouldn't it? To submit to, to God, the supreme authority of the, of the universe, that would mean limiting my identity. Wouldn't it? Of course it... Really? The truth is the opposite. It's when we submit ourselves to our maker, right? To the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our Savior, Jesus Christ. When we submit to him, we receive the life that is truly life. Right? He doesn't steamroll over who we are. He helps us become who we truly are meant to be. When we submit to him, that's when we receive an identity that fulfills. That's when we receive a peace that transcends all understanding. That's when we receive a love that conquers guilt and shame. When we receive strength to say no to the sin that imprisons and destroys Jesus Christ sets people free to be who they are meant to be. It's the opposite of oppression. I'd love to read you this quote uh, by C.S. Lewis. Everyone, you know, no message is complete without a quote from C.S. Lewis. Great British intellectual, children's author, you know, wrote Narnia, but also a prodigious mind, one of the great minds of the 20th century. He became a Christian later in life. 
He described himself as the most unwilling convert, but kept finding himself drawn to God. He's got this great quote. It's a little bit long. I don't have it on the screen, but follow along with me. I found it really great. This is C.S. Lewis speaking of his own journey of conversion, and he said this, I became aware that I was holding something at bay or shutting something out. Or, if you like, that I was wearing some stiff clothing like corsets or, or even a suit of armour, as if I were a lobster. I felt myself being there and then given a free choice. I could open the door or keep it shut. I could unbuckle the armour or keep it on. Neither choice was presented as a duty. No threat or promise was attached to either, though I knew that to open the door or to take off the corset meant the incalculable. The choice appeared to be momentous, but it was also strangely unemotional. I was moved by no desires or fears. In a sense, I was not moved by anything. I chose to open, to unbuckle, to loosen the rein. I say I chose, yet it did not really seem possible to do the opposite. On the other hand, I was aware of no motives. You could argue that I was not a free agent, but I'm more inclined to think this came nearer to being a perfectly free act than most I've ever done. Isn't that a great description of how Jesus Christ operates? This is how the transforming grace of Jesus works. Gradual, gradual gentle, all-powerful and infinitely kind. Now, is that a rare combination or what? All-powerful and infinitely kind. There's so much more we could focus on in this passage. Really, there is. But there's just one more thing I want to highlight, okay, in the time that we have left. And, and it really struck me. We talked about it earlier. And it's this. It's how humbled Saul became. It's hard to miss in the story, isn't it? I mean, this proud, arrogant man on, this, on a mission from God, knocked off his horse, by the light of Jesus Christ, blinded, vulnerable, right now having to be taken by the hand into the city. He's then led into the home of a Christian. Could you imagine? If he had had his way hours before, he would have arrested and imprisoned the person who was now hosting him. I mean, what a, an upside down thing to happen. This man's been humbled. People he was trying to kill and now caring for him. Well, wow. And this is something, right? No matter how you became a Christian, you will share this with Saul. The transforming power of God's grace being at work in you, number one. And two, the role humility plays in coming to faith. Right? We know this. It takes humility to receive Christ, doesn't it? Or it takes humility to receive him as Lord. And a saviour, there's no other way to become a Christian. Sorry. <laughs> no other way. All you need is need. There's no catch. Well, actually, maybe there is one. To receive the free gift of grace, all you need is need. But it's harder than you think. Humbling ourselves, being humbled, let's face it. Come on, can we be honest? It's rarely comfortable. Who puts, I'd like to be humbled, please. Come on. But it is the way of life. If Christ is to, be, is to be believed, if the Bible is to be believed, the way of humility is the way to life. You know, I've often thought this question, it's a bit childish, but I don't know, sometimes Pip and I, we often think about this when we're out people watching, we like people watching, and we just think, man, why don't more people become Christians? Have you ever thought that? You know, what are you doing, God? Why don't more people accept this good news? Have we got good news to share? Yes, we do. It is good news, life-changing news. Why don't more people accept his incredible offer of love and forgiveness, life, grace? I think maybe this topic is part of the answer. Humility, right? It's not easy to humble ourselves. Is it? It's not easy to bow the knee. Vulnerability is not easy. We don't like it. I don't like it. 
I think particularly for us, you know, middle class Mossman folk, it's not easy. I, and I'm one, right? Humility, it's hard. The other day, um, we had breakfast out with our family. It was for, for one of our kids' birthdays. And we like to do that, you know, go for pancakes at a cafe or something like that. And <clears throat> speaking of vulnerability, I'll get a bit vulnerable here. I'll admit, I was not in the best mood that morning. Yes, it's possible your pastor is not always upbeat. <laughs> I won't make excuses. It was late night, early morning. Don't think I slept very well. But you know what? doesn't matter. I was being a cranky poo, as my kids would say. <laughs> I was. You're not allowed to nod, Pip. You're just not allowed. <laughs> but I was. I was. I'll admit it. Anyway, it was, um, I dropped the family off at the cafe. It was raining, which seems to happen all the time in Sydney at the moment, right? And um, praise God for the sun today. Uh, but I dropped the family off at the cafe and to, to go and grab a table, and I went and parked a car. And, uh, you know, I wasn't in a great mood. And in those moments, God, by his grace, intervened. He convicted me in that moment. I just, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I just, you know what it's like. The Spirit of God lives within us, and I just felt convicted. I just felt him say, what is, classic question, what's going on? Dave, what's going on? Are you being the man you want to be? We want you to be. Are you being the husband and the father that we want you to be? I just, no, I'm not. Not in this moment. And I just felt God say, in his kindness, what can we do about it? Let's make it right. Should we make it right? And, but I'll be honest, right? In that moment, it's a wrestle. Because I don't want to humble myself. There's a part of me that doesn't want to say sorry. I want to hold on to my pride. It's a wrestle. Because it's hard. I'm thinking, oh... That's, that, uh, that I'm admitting that I'm wrong and that I'm going to admit, but Jesus, hey, you don't need to be insecure. You can be secure in me. No one can take that away from you. Therefore, you can be free to seek forgiveness from people. So I went up to the cafe. I just said, guys, before we eat, can I just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being a cranky poo this morning. I'm sorry. I'd love to ask for your forgiveness. Can we please start again? It's not easy, is it? Humility, the way of humility, the way of forgiveness, it's not easy. But it brings life. Humility is the path to faith. Recognizing our right standing before God, let's not kid ourselves, it's confronting. But it opens the floodgates, right, to receive Christ's grace. There is no other way. It might be hard, but it is the way to life. This is what Paul says about himself. This is great, right? And the life of Christ. Last quote. 1 Timothy 1. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I love this. Of whom I'm the worst. Wow. Wow. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, just in case you didn't get it before, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Humility is the path to faith and the posture of the heart for every Christian. From conversion onwards, amen? This is what I just don't understand, probably a bit of a side note here, but I don't understand prideful Christians doesn't make sense to me because in order to enter the kingdom of God you got to bow the knee you have to so no one can boast where is boasting it's excluded it doesn't make sense this is the posture of every Christian's heart from from day one humility so much more to say about this passage but let's sum up okay as we close what are we taking away from this morning what are our takeaways here's a thought I wonder if you've had it. There's just no way that person could ever become a Christian. You ever thought that? I have. You ever thought that, man, they're so far away from God, there's no way they could become a Christian. 
I've thought that. Shame on me, I've thought it, you know. What are we believing about God in that moment when we think that? We are believing, God, you can't do it. It's too hard for you. Is it up to us to sum up what God can and can't do? I I hope this morning's been a reminder to have confidence. God can do the impossible. Think Saul out to kill Christians. Change his heart. I want you to think about the most anti-Christian person in your life. The most, you know, opposed to faith person in your family, in your friendship group, wherever they are. I want you to think about them. God can do the impossible. He can. And yet, I think... It's no small thing for someone to become a Christian, right? It's no small thing to bow the knee. In the story, scales had to fall from Saul's eyes in order for him to see with eyes of faith. It's no small thing. But an encouragement for Saul. Instead of doubting that God can do it, oh, it's it's never going to happen. Instead of that, and also instead of getting annoyed with people who just aren't getting it, when we share our faith with people. May we have the gentleness and kindness of Christ. Remembering once we were lost. And may we be driven to prayer, to ask God to do what only he can do. Asking God to do the impossible, to bring people from death to life, to change people's hearts. May we be people of prayer that seek him to do the impossible, because only he can do it. What else? What are some other takeaways? Well, I think no matter what your story is, no matter your conversion story, your experience, no need to be discouraged if it's not supernatural and amazing like Saul's one, right? Absolutely not. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that we humbly accept Christ as Lord and Savior through faith. And if that's the case, then you can be assured his powerful grace has been at work in you. Rejoice in the new life and freedom that Christ brings to our lives. Finally, what are some other takeaways? May we be reminded that Jesus is gentle and kind. You know, I don't know where everyone's at today. I hope there's some people here that are not yet Christians. I would hope that's the posture of our church, that people are here with questions, seeking out faith. I would love for our church to be a place like that. If that's you, you are so welcome here. But maybe that is you. Maybe you're on a bit of a journey. Maybe you're seeking out answers to big questions. Maybe you're actually wondering, what would it really be like if I gave my life to this Jesus? What would it be like? Well, know this. My guess is that he's already been at work in you, prodding. And I want you to know that he won't overcome you, right? He, he, he may overwhelm you with his love and mercy, but he'll never take away your freedom. He'll never steamroll over who you are. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus seeks to free you from all that would keep you from the life that is truly life. That's who we worship. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God of grace. Thank you that you pursue us even when we don't want anything to do with you. Jesus, you came to seek and to save the lost. You said it of yourself. And all we need to do is put up our hand and go, we're, we're kind of lost. We need you. We thank you for being so incredibly kind and gentle and gracious with us. Lord God, we, we pray that this church would be a place that embodies that truth, that we stand up for the truth of who you are and what the Bible teaches, absolutely. But that would also embody kindness, and gentleness, the fruit of the Spirit, as we seek to be your people here and to be a light in this area. Bless our witness to this area and bless 
us as we share the good news, the grace of Jesus. In your powerful name we pray, Lord. Amen.